In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Somehow, some way, on my first Sunday sermon at Christ Church after my nuptials on October 26th, I am tasked with today's teaching on marriage <laughs> and the afterlife. Having been married only two weeks, <laughs> may come as no surprise that I am not yet an expert on marriage. Therefore, I will take the much easier route this Sunday and talk about death <laughs> and eternal life and what happens when we cross from this world to the next. A much easier topic, right? Last Saturday on All Souls Day, I was privileged to preside at a private family burial in Greenwood Union Cemetery here in Rye. As we said goodbye to the deceased, brown leaves were breaking free from the tree branches and they drifted listlessly on top of the gravesite. The air was crisp, the dirt which we sprinkled on the lowered casket cold. My surroundings, both natural and circumstantial, were a stark reminder that we have reached the time of year that the earth prepares for its seasonal death with colder temperatures, shorter days, and longer nights. And like our seasonal calendar, our liturgical, our church calendar, the yearly church calendar of feasts and celebrations that we keep common and shared among, with other Christian denominations, continues this theme. Last week was the All Hallows Tide Triduum of All Hallows Eve, or what we kind of know in the secular world as Halloween, All Saints Day on November 1st, and All Souls Day, three days that Christians embrace our relationship with death and the afterlife and celebrate the revered saints and the lives of family and friends who have come before us. Last Sunday, we observed All Saints Sunday in our parish. Our choir sang the Durifle Requiem, also being sung today at 3 p.m. And we named aloud our loved ones who died in the year since last All Saints Day in 2018. As a clergyman dedicated to the pastoral care of this church, I recognize that these remembrances and this time of year can be quite difficult for many of us in the congregation. And so I wade into these waters cautiously, but full of love, compassion, and empathy. We continue themes of death and new life with God throughout November. Each Sunday's scripture readings ponder the fragility of human life and the promise of Jesus Christ who lived died, and vows to come to us again. Themes of death and everlasting life are prevalent in our sacred texts and prayers today, beginning with our opening collect and the words that collate the texts and prayers of today's worship. Here's part of what we prayed at the start of today's worship. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom. The theme continues in our reading from the book of Job. Our text from Job is extracted from a complaint Job makes about God to his friends. Job is in the midst of calamitous misfortune and a cruel twist of fate brought upon by a wager between God and Satan. Job has lost the things that matter most to him in life. His children has died. His worldly possessions have been taken from him, and he now finds himself in sickly health. He wonders why he suffers and is so near to death and why God has permitted these things to happen to a righteous man. In a now famous passage that we heard earlier, 
Job cries aloud that on the last day he shall still see God, and that his Redeemer will vindicate him. Discussions of death and everlasting life are present in our gospel from Luke. The scenes open with a confrontation between Jesus and the Sadducees, a group of Jewish leaders who did not believe in resurrection after death. The Sadducees are trying to trap Jesus in his teaching of God's kingdom, presenting an absurd worst-case scenario for Jesus to solve. Here's a bit of the backstory. In Jewish law, the brother-in-law of a young widow would, who was childless would remarry the widow to, pro, to procreate and keep the husband's family name alive. To trap Jesus' teaching of resurrected life, the Sadducees asked Jesus which brother is the woman married to in the afterlife, should all of the husbands from the same family die and she remain childless. A convoluted question, but nothing that Jesus can't handle. Jesus responds that as children of resurrected life with God, they are no longer married in an earthly, contractual way for purposes of procreation, because marriage and procreation is no longer necessary for those who inherit eternal life. Rather, those who die and enter everlasting life are like angels and children of God. Do our prayers and readings this morning cause your mind to kind of speculate and wonder like mine? Heirs of eternal life. Confidence that the Redeemer lives and on the last day we will see God. Everlasting life as of angels and children of God. Our texts and prayers make me wonder. What do we believe happens when we die? In essence, this is the question that belies the Sadducees' unsuccessful trap of Jesus. And it's a question I'm sure we've all asked ourselves at some point in our life, even since we were little children. While I haven't been confronted with death too often in my personal life, as a priest, it is something I think on and think through quite often. Humans have pondered this eternal question since the beginning of time. It's life's great mystery. And like most mysteries, the beholder must wait for the grand reveal. And so we pray and sit with the ambiguities and the discomforts of the unknown. And we seek, like you all have here today, whether it is your first time here or your 10,000th. We search for truth that makes sense to us and our family. For all who wonder, and that's probably all of us here today, may I suggest that we pray, read, and meditate on God's holy word and revel in great works of art of the human spirit that may help us see through the dim glass that we don't yet comprehend and into the other side. In Scripture, Jesus tells us that he is with us always unto the end of the ages. He is our gate to eternal life, to the kingdom of God. And in him we find everlasting life with God. In Christ, all will be made alive. The letters of St. Paul convey to us that nothing, not even death, shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul understands death and eternal life to be a part of a great change. Though our bodies may be committed to ground or to ash, our spiritual selves will be raised in glory, imperishable with God. Our creeds, developed years after the New Testament and still clung to this day, state the same. We believe in all that is seen and unseen. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. In addition to scripture and creedal beliefs, our understanding of life and the life to come can be enriched through majestic art. Poet Emily Dickinson lived most of her life isolated in her Massachusetts home, dying at the age of 55. Dickinson preferred life apart, a way, uh, a characteristic that coupled with her untimely young death permeates her work. In her poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, Dickinson describes death as a company to earthly life. Yet even as death sweeps the speaker into a carriage ride away from earthly life, the speaker continues as, as cognizant, embracing the idea that there is an eternal life to come once we leave this place. Here is the poem's memorable first stanza, followed by its final one. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but ourselves and immortality. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter by the day, I first surmised the horses' heads were turned towards eternity. We have all wondered at times what is to come beyond this earthly experience. That wondering doesn't make you any less Christian or any less faithful. In fact, it makes you more human. Wrestling with this ultimate existential question is part of our shared experience across cultures and across time. What we do know is this. Death is a hard and often terrible experience. It is painful for those who grieve the loss, and in the circumstances we wish upon no one, dying itself can be an experience of suffering and hardship, too. Where, then, amidst death's suffering and an unknown, do we find our comfort? As Christians, we turn to our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, who in his human life wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus, consoled Mary and Martha in their distress, promised paradise to a thief who repented, and faced death himself on the cross, only to rise victorious that glorious Easter three days later. And we pray that in death Christ opens the kingdom of heaven, and that one day we may inherit that heavenly city, that new Jerusalem, alongside all of our loved ones who have come to before, who wait for us at the gates, saying, Welcome home. At the conclusion of today's service, we sing one of my favorite hymns, Jerusalem the Golden. I love this hymn for its dramatic, triumphant tune, which, through tears and trembling voice, I am often not able to finish. But I also adore this hymn for its soul-searching text, of which I have combined the words of two stanzas to leave you with today. Jesus, in mercy, bring us to that dear land of rest, who art with God the Father and Spirit ever blessed. I know not, oh, I know not, what joys await us there, what radiancy of glory, what bliss beyond compare. Amen. <laughs>